Hello ladies and gentlemen, Nick here and welcome to my ranking of Doctor Who Series 7, aka Season 33. Wow, 33 rankings and we're not even finished yet, we've got 5 more to go afterwards. <laughs> so um, yeah, 33 down, 5 to go, well, when this is done. Um, yeah, and that's 7 series of the new series, again, 5 more till we're, till we're, till we're up, to get, up to date. So... Doctor Who Series 7, the third and final series, sadly, of the 11th Doctor, played by Matt Smith. Sadly, as I mentioned at the end of my The Name of the Doctor review, Matt Smith decided a few weeks after this, the last episode broadcast that he would step down from the role, only doing one more Christmas special to, um, where he would regenerate into the 12th Doctor, who would later be announced to be Peter Capaldi, um, would, and that would be the last one he would do, as opposed to doing one more series. Um, or even a few more specials, uh, like David Tennant. So, Matt Smith decided to step, after doing the 50th anniversary special, he decided to step down after doing one more special, um, which would wrap up his Doctor Zero and regenerate him into, into the 12th Doctor. Sadly, of course, that means that um, every all the stuff from the 11th Doctor Zero that were all building up to some sort of uh, conclusion has to be done in one last epi one episode. It's um, what would have been a series worth, perhaps, of story arc wrap-up, is going to be tied down, tied up in one episode. But we will get to that episode later. In the meantime, we've got Series 7, which deliberately goes away from the series arc so it can focus on more standalone adventures to, for, as it's the 50th anniversary se series. Although on retrospective, because of Smith stepping down before doing Series 8, instead of doing Series 8, this then means Series 7 is a bit of a wasted opportunity in terms of the story arc of his Doctor's era, which is a massive shame. Uh, oh well, series. Um, what is series seven like, anyways? Um, again, as I mentioned at the uh, end of my the name of the Doctor review, this is a pretty turbulent and rocky series. There is quite a few episodes that are brilliant, and there's a quite a few episodes that are absolute shit, um, or at the very least, not very good. Um, so this is probably the most um, rocky and uh, turbulent series of the of the revived series so far, and the most of the show since season twenty four, um, which is a massive shame. Uh, it's the fiftieth anniversary series. It's probably the weakest of the fiftieth anniversary series, although this is the only one to have any ten out of ten episodes in it, um, unless we're counting anniversary specials, in which case five doctors. But yeah, this is the only anniversary series ten, twenty, and thirty three to have 10 out of 10 stories, although those other two series are, uh, seasons are better, especially season 10. That was a great season. Um, but yes, um, just because there's 10 out of 10s in this season or series doesn't mean it's perfect. Um, see, unless it has several of them, in which case then maybe um, it would be pretty high um, in opinion. But uh, there's also a couple of weaker ones, and it's got um, probably the, it's also got the worst episode of the revived series so far, and another stinker as well um in the in the series so yeah so let's jump right in to series seven with the ranking the episodes are <clears throat> the doctor the widow in the wardrobe asylum of the daleks dinosaurs on a spaceship a town called mercy the power of three the angels take manhattan the snowmen the belt of saint john the rings of akaten cold war hide Journey to the Centre of the TARDIS, The Crimson Horror, Nightmare in Silver, and The Name of the Doctor. So, without wasting any more time, because there's 15 episodes to rank. 15 individual episodes. No two-parters. 15 individual episodes, including the two Christmas specials. We've got to go straight into it, starting off with number 15. I'll try not to talk about them too much um, in that case. Number 15... I can safely say at this point in time is the worst episode of the Revive series and the worst episode of the show since Time in the Rani. Asylum of the Daleks. What can I add that I have not already added to my um, um, review of the story without having to do some sort of commentary of the episode? Okay, um, let's recap some terror, some of the worst things of the episode. Um, Amy Roy's subplot, uh, divorce subplot, is the worst subplot of the entire show. It, it, or at least one of them, it completely insults those two characters. And at, when I watched that episode, I honestly 
stopped caring for the two characters. The rest of the series had to make me care for them again so that I would be sad to see them go in their last episode like I would have done if they hadn't had this shit subplot. If it wasn't for this sub shit subplot, I would probably be more emotional. But thanks to this, I, I had to stop caring for the characters until the other, and then the other four episodes of, this, of the first half of the series had to make me care again. And whilst that is a... Um, I'll give those four episodes this. They made me care about them. They did their job right but this episode was this the episode to make us stop caring about these characters so that we could get caring about them again because if he was trying to make us care about them more it did a terrible job the divorce subplot is shit i go into explanation about it in the review but it, let's be honest it's shit anyway you, the reason is because of amy can't have kids anymore what what the hell and it just it just doesn't work and the Daleks are botched as well. The Daleks get a botchery in this episode. And the and the story's just a bit dull in places. And there's lots of contradictions and plot holes. And it just... It feels... It just doesn't work. This can't have been the real first episode, could it? I go into more problems and explanations about this story in the review. So do check that out. It's a 40 to 50 minute rant. Um, more or less. It's probably my biggest Doctor Who rant since Time in the Rani. Um, but... Yeah, well, it's because it's the worst episode since that story. Sorry, Fear Her haters. Sorry, Love and Monsters haters. Sorry, Let's Kill he Hitler haters. Sorry, Rest of Season 24 haters. Um, sorry, this is the worst episode since Time of the Rani, and it's probably going to stay that way until we get to Hell Bench. Possibly. Um, but, yeah, this is, um, this is a pretty shit story, and a pretty insultive one towards Amy and Rory, to the Daleks, best characters of the Doctor by default. Um, and the same would be said for my next choice. So, yeah, A Sign of the Daleks, worst episode of the series and worst episode of the revived series so far. As of the name of the Doctor's broadcast, this is the worst one since Time in the Rani. Number 14. This one isn't as bad as um, Asylum, but it's still pretty weak. Journey to the Centre of the TARDIS. The weakest episode of Series 7 Part 2, um, following off the back of the weakest episode of Series 7 Part 1 um, at 15th. But Journey to the Centre of the TARDIS is also pretty bad. We've got some boring supporting characters with the um, Van Trotter brothers, or whatever they were called. Especially the um, oldest one. Go get me some food. <laughs> the actor was pretty bad. And he's a pretty uh, terrible character anyway. The other two aren't, don't do too much better. But at least there's some sort of... Um, personality to them there are at least some sort of thing we can care about but not much and the characters are quite boring clara's at her most boring and this is probably jenna coleman's weakest performance out of um her first eight episodes or well, first 10 episodes i just say i should say actually um and yeah and the whole thing is uh resolved by the doctor pressing a button to reset time and, you know, this was supposed to be a nostalgic trip for TARDIS fans. Maybe the Doctor and Clara would go exploring the TARDIS and um, see some rooms and stuff. But, no, they cheated out of that. Um, apart from a few occasions where they go to the library or the workshop or whatever. It's just around this dull and terrible plot and it involves these stupid monsters. And it just, it comes to absolute nothing in the end. It's just absolute nothing. And like Asylum of the Daleks being a nostalgic trip for Daleks fans. Or at least that's what it appeared to be and it turned out not to be. This is absolute wasted potential. Number 13. The weakest of the two Christmas specials. The two Christmas specials of this series fared pretty um, badly. Now, I'm not one of the people who hates the Christmas specials. There's a lot of Christmas special dis um, dislikers and haters. Although many of them did get very pissy when they learned that 2018 wasn't getting one. And, and Resolution was going to be a New Year special instead. So, um, yeah, contradictory much. Um, but... Yeah, but the Christmas specials aren't really that popular. Maybe a few are liked by fans. I personally like a couple of the, um, quite a few of the Russell T Davies ones. Um, and I like uh, Christmas Carol. And at this point in time, The Return of Doctor Mysterio. Maybe also uh, Husbands of River Song. Series 7s too are kind of disappointing, um, both of them. Now, whilst The Doctor, The Widow and The Wardrobe is usually cited as the weakest Christmas special, that or Twice Upon a Time... Um, my least favourite of the two from Series 7 is actually the following Christmas special, The Snowmen. Yeah, I put The Snowmen below The Doctor and the Widow in the Wardrobe because 
Doctor Who in the Wardrobe is a bit of a dull story in places, but it's not terrible. Snowmen, I, okay, I wouldn't say it's terrible, but I think there's more problems with this one. I think there's more problems. There's a couple of plot holes, again. Um, the villains are less interesting, um, believe it or not. Um, and it just, and it just feels like, it just, um, this just feels like there's something a bit off this time around. It, there is still, like, there is just, it's just here to set up the Dr. Clara relationship, which is, which is good, but it forgets there's a story going on at the same time as well, in places. It just, I don't know, there's just something odd about this one. I don't, I can't quite put my finger on it, but there is a few problems. It's also the only episode of the show to actually make me depressed. Um, specifically the ending with Clara dying and the realisation, oh, it's, we're doing this again. It's, it's um, a nutch dies just after getting the TARDIS key. It was, she just, she just got it so she could die. And it turns out she liked the, the silent with the Daleks, Clara, um, Oswin. And it's just there to set up this mystery that's going to play out through Series 7 Part 2. And, you know, I just got depressed after seeing that, the end of that episode. I just got depressed when I first saw it. So, yeah, I had to go upstairs and have a think, uh, have a few minutes to myself. I only came back downstairs to watch the... Because um, the Top Gear James Bond special was having a repeat. And uh, so I got... I watched, um, about, what, 30 to 40 minutes of that. I'd already seen it um, back in October when it aired. But I only came back down to watch the... A remainder of that. That was a good episode of Top Gear, by the way, the James Bond car special, 50th anniversary of um, Bond. Yeah, totally recommend watching it if you can find it. Should be on DVD. Um, but yeah, the, the, the Snowman, that is the only Doctor episode that's actually made me depressed uh, one way or another. Uh, in this case, um, the Victorian Clara dying and setting up this mystery. Oh, God. The mystery, the, the beginning of the mystery has made, made me depressed. Oh, God. What well, made me depressed on the first viewing? <sighs> Moving on to number 12, the better of the two Christmas specials, in my opinion. Although not by much. The Doctor, the Widow and the Wardrobe. Again, this one doesn't really have much going for it. I didn't get depressed or anything. I, I can understand people getting bored and frustrated. Um, this one does have a bit of a toll dull tone but I do think it's um executed a bit better it looks nice um Lily is a pretty good supporting child character although Cyril the actor playing him really needs to put on a few more facial expressions throughout the story um I think Madge is okay but I think they could have had a bit more to her as a character and Claire Skinner could have had a bit more uh good direction but she was all right one does not turn Alexander Armstrong into a stalker um character and the plot itself, it's all right, it's nice, but it's not in to totally engaging for the audience. It's its good. I think A Christmas Carol is a bit more engaging because we knew the Christmas Carol story, but it was doing a brand new spin on it, and we were getting introduced to these pretty interesting characters. Here, not so much, and um, while the Snowman has some previously established characters who are interesting, it's the plot around them that is the issue. So, Series 7's Christmas specials, and I can't, I'm not going to speak for the time of the Doctor just yet, but for the other two, it's, um, we're kind of a, a weak point so far. Maybe Time of the Doctor will be a bit of a step up, uh, especially as that's the story that has to wrap up the 11th Doctor story arc. But, um, as for these two, it's a bit of a disappointment. I put Doctor Widow and Wardrobe above the Snowmen because I think there is a slightly stronger plot, um, although the stat's not saying an awful lot. Moving on to number 11, and this is a, another, um, story from Series 7 Part 1. And it says a, another Stephen Moffat episode, so you know which one this is. It features the departure of Amy and Rory and the return of River Song and the Weeping Angels. The Angels Take Manhattan. Yeah, again, this one's got a few plot holes and it's not entirely engaging. And there's some really strange stuff. Why do we have that noir detective opening? Why do, not, do we not see Brian Williams again? I know it's Chris Chippen's character, but why do we not see Brian Williams again? Um, uh, River is more flirty and flirtatious in this story than she uh, has ever been. And yet this is supposed to be after her, for her, after Series 5. So, yeah, she's gone back to how she was at the end of Series 6 Part 2, but less mature. Um... Which is odd. I much prefer her in the name of the Doctor, let's be honest. Um, I much prefer her maturity in that story post her death, as opposed to trying to act all sexy and flirty in this story. Though Alex Kingston does do a good job. Um, 
poor old Rory gets really badly treated in this story. Apart from his sacrifice scene, he is just screwed all over the place. And it's a shame that he doesn't get a proper goodbye. And the way that it's handled with Rory and Amy, the, well, the scenes with um, Amy talking to the Doctor in River is um, good. But the way she gets sent back in time, that she shouldn't have been because the Doctor and River were looking at the angel. And River, was, Amy, was looking at the angel when Rory was taken. So they sh he shouldn't have been taken back. Um, Grayling as a character isn't that much interesting. And I think it's nice to have a try and set our, have a noir mystery detective story set style story for this episode. But I think it gets misguided in places. And we just go on a bit of a... Um, just a uh, detour. We go on a detour for a bit. It's a bit of a disappointment, disappointing way for Amy and Rory to leave the series, especially as I mentioned with Asylum the Darks. That episode in the room, not Asylum, um, Angels, as well as the three episodes in between Asylum and Angels, made me care about these characters again. After Asylum, pretty much tried to, pretty much killed my uh, love for the two characters from the previous two series. But thankfully, the rest of Series Seven Part One made me care about them enough um, for me to be sad when they left in this episode. It, however, this is um, this is a pretty weak way for them. To, well, it's a good way for them to go. It's just that it was handled badly with the um, that they should have been taken if the angels were being looked at. <sighs> what can I say? Well, apart from what I just said. Okay, so we're moving out of um, bad going into weak, mediocre territory to going into just mediocre territory now with number ten. Cold War. I just thought this one was okay. Um, it just didn't. It didn't really do enough that much for me, apart from returning the Ice Warriors. But even then, Scald Act motivations weren't that great. Ice Warrior law introduced here is pretty good. Um, but unlike the Sontarans, it isn't really as effective. Um, and it's not really as great of a story, a great story. I am glad that it's written by someone who loves the Ice Warriors, Mark Gatiss. He cares about these monsters. He, he cares to write about them, as opposed to, say, Stephen Moffat with the Daleks, perhaps. Um, but Mark Gatiss, he cares about writing for the Ice Warriors. So, yeah, and the idea of the uh, submarine, uh, Cold War Russian submarine, is a great setting and time location. Although, um, with the whole Ice Warriors stuff, it wouldn't really, it could have been anywhere else any other time. And it wouldn't have made much of a difference. But, you know, it's interesting backdrop. But I just I don't think this one quite succeeds. Um, so, which is a shame. I think it could have been handled a little bit better. And, of course, we've got so many red shirts that they try to put some sort of personality on these guys. But and it just comes to nothing. They're not even characters we get to know and love and get upset when they die. Um, but, yeah, it's a shame. But it's still okay. Moving on to number nine, another great writer writes a just a okay story, and that's if his script didn't get rewritten by someone else. Um, this is Nightmare in Silver. Neil Gaiman's return and the return of the Simon with a brand new Cyberman design. However, this episode, either in the script or in the execution or both, seems to be in too much of a hurry. It just wants to rush this episode out it just wants to make sure this episode's over and done with which is a massive shame i'm trying to win i want to see the new cyberman designs be put to good use but it just feels a bit odd and they kind of cheat the new cyberman designs some of uh new um traits they do like take off the helmet take off the hand spin the head round. that's fine but when these constant upgrades they're not they're kind of cheating and i forgot to mention this in the review but i didn't actually find them that scary this episode was supposed to make the Cybermen scary again. That was the brief. Um, that and the inspirations are from the moon base and the tomb of the Cybermen. I, but I didn't find the Cybermen scary in this one. In fact, they were a bit of a joke in places. Um, not too much. Uh, the Cyber Planner is brilliant, although a bit more emo um, even more emotional than the Cyber Leaders from Revenge of the Cybermen and Earthshock put together. But Matt Smith does an outstanding performance, both uh, playing that character and the Doctor. It could or possibly be Matt Smith's best performance so far. Well, that will ring the back of ten. Um, there is a lot to choose from, though. Um, he hasn't done anything wrong any, um, yet, anyway. So, yeah. But, yeah, Nightmare and Silver, I just think it's a bit of a um, weak. Oh, and Angie and Artie, they didn't need to be here. 
if the, you, you're going to have them here, make them do stuff. And uh, uh, don't make um, Angie a bit of a selfish brat. And also make Clara more in, um, worried about their safety. She's worried, but not um, not so much that she actually cares about them um, that much. It's like, oh no! So yeah, uh, make Clara more worried for them. Uh, okay, moving on to number eight. Um, back to Series 7 Part uh, 1, the last two of Series 7 Part 2. And we've got... Um, Chris Chibnall writing for the series. Um, uh, this is his last episode before he became the showrunner, and it was a shame that he didn't write any in, in between because it would have made a bit more sense to have him as a showrunner after if he wrote another uh, any Capaldi series stories. This is his last one before The Woman Who Felt Worth. And in all honesty, it starts really great. And then when we get to the end, it's um, a bit of a disappointment with a disappointing ending. The Power of Free. Right, so this one and also my number seven choice have a similar issue with each other. They start off really well. We've got some great character stuff in this episode. A bit like Closing Time in Series 6. We've got some great character um, stuff with the Doctor, the Ponds, and Brian Williams. Um, as well as Kate Stewart as they're trying to investigate this mystery. And throughout the episode, um, we're just wondering what's going on. And then when we get towards the end, it's kind of disappointing how it's wrapped up. Maybe it wouldn't have been too disappointing if it had been edited both in the um, actual cutting room room and the actual and the script room it's been edited both side both areas um in the script and the um post-production rooms um, pre and post productions it's just been a um little bit to cut around and the, the final climax is a bit dull and pretty weak but the strongest stuff about this episode is the character uh, relationships and this is apparently what chris Chibnall is strongest at outside of doctor who is character stuff um and we can definitely see that in some of his Doc 2 stories as well, spe specifically here. Sadly, I think once he once he becomes showrunner, he does lose some of that um, character growth stuff, uh, character building stuff, um, character inter interacting stuff. Maybe it's because he's got a whole show to run now as opposed to individual episodes. Um, but still, I like the character interaction stuff here, and it's a pretty good mystery. It's just a shame the ending lets it down. Number seven, again, this one starts off really well, and you know, it keeps up its pace a bit more, um, but the ending kind of lets, this ending kind of lets it down, and you know, these two episodes are the two episodes that usually refer to when people say Series 7 has the worst endings, uh, Series 7 episodes have the worst endings of um, most series. It's usually these two that get referenced. Um, Power 3 and number 7, Hide. Yeah, Hide is a great episode to begin with, but it starts to go downhill when we get to the sci-fi stuff. It's not bad, per se, but it kind of loses the horror element, scary story stuff. I mean, so, to be honest, Ghostlight did that too um, back in 1989. I wasn't too fond of that one, but that's because I couldn't actually follow that one most of the time as well. Um, so I couldn't really follow that one. It was just, I just couldn't get into it because I could barely follow what was going on. Not because it was confusing, but just because I couldn't actually follow what was going on. Um, here it just uh, jumped. It, um, here it's, I can see what's going on. And, you know, it's nice to have a small cast of characters as well. It's small supporting cast. Um, and they do great. Duggery Scott as um, Professor Alec Palmer and Jessica Rain as uh, Emma Grayling. Great supporting characters. Um, and also the um, time traveller lady, Hilla, is also pretty good in her few scenes. Not, I mean, she's not she's not going to win any awards, unlike the other two supporting characters, perhaps, um, for her supporting characterness, but she's all right. And the Crooked Men, uh, man and woman, are <laughs> interesting design monsters. It's, um, I do think that ending should have been handled better when the Doctor realises they're monsters in love and they need to be together. I think that should have been a realisation during the climax, as opposed to after the climax and a rushed last minute twist at the end. That's why I think most people cite this ending as well as the Power of Freeze ending for being one of the worst, um, have for this series having some of the worst endings. And I can totally see why. Although the um, Journey of the Centre of the TARDIS, this one is even worse. So that was Hyde um, from Series 7 Part 2 back to Series 7 Part 1 for two more episodes, the last two episodes of um, Series 7 Part 1 to rank. Um, Starting with number six, A Town Called Mercy.
I honestly really liked this one on a rewatch. I thought this was a really great episode. No, it's not perfect, and there is a few issues, but I liked it. The supporting characters were good. Um, the Gunslinger was an interesting yet sympathetic villain, a lot like um, Skaldak from the Cold War, except this time this guy's motivations were a little bit more relatable. Um, or Skaldax, they were just, they were kind of a bit muddled. Despite following Ice Warrior Lord that was being introduced, but they were still a bit muddled. Um, also have Jack, who is also sort of a villain, but at the same time, he's sort, we can kind of understand where he's coming from. So again, he could be a kind of a sympathetic villain. Ice is a great supporting character, and this is a case of where you do get to care for a supporting character who then dies, and you're sorry for him. Although this happens halfway through as opposed to towards the end. But, you know I, it's a good example. Um, the other supporting characters are good, but they're not really worth mentioning about, apart from the fact that the uh, great, great grand, uh, great granddaughter of the little girl of the episode is the narrator, which is a bit of a, a, a what a reveal. That is a what. So we're saying that this old lady, who is the great granddaughter of this little girl, is telling the story in the present day, perhaps. It's a bit strange. Um, the and Amy and Rory don't all that this is their least um amount to do in the, in any episode um that they're in. Uh, I think, which is a shame because this is one of the last episodes they're in. Um it did make I, I did care for them in this episode, but they did need to do a, they should have done a little bit more to do because they didn't really do that much. But I still like the town called Mercy. I thought it was a great uh, fun story. And it's a much better Western style Doctor Who story than the gunfighters from 1966. Oh god, yes. Um, okay, moving on to number five, the last episode from series seven, part one, so, um, to mention. So this is the best one. And it's the other of the two Christopher North stories, and probably my favourite of his prior to becoming showrunner. Dinosaurs on a spaceship. Dinosaurs on a spaceship. Yeah, this is a great episode. Yeah, it's not perfect, but it's fun. It's enjoyable. Um, after the shit fest of Asylum of the Daleks, this episode is light years ahead. As it's as it's episode on as a usual episode, um, it's still really good. It's still fun. Solomon is a great villain, and David Bradley does a great performance. And it won't be the last time he's in the show. Mark Williams is amazing as as Brian Williams. I'm so glad we got to see him again in the Power Three. It is a bit of a shame we don't see him again, apart from the P.S. Minnesota. But even then, that's only in a drawing, sadly. Um, these other supporting characters, um, other two allies of the Doctor, Queen Nefertiti, um, okay, the character's not that great, but I still like her, and uh, the actress does a great job, and John Riddell has a quite a bit of personality, and Rupert Graves of Sherlock, um, notability, he was Inspector Lestrade in Sherlock, he is fantastic. Okay, the character, I wouldn't say he's fantastic, but um, the character's great, but Rupert Graves is amazing. Um, and Dr. Amy and Rory also get some great moments. It's great that Rory is signed, uh, teamed up with the Doctor this time around and Brian is um, with them. So those three have to do stuff together. Whilst Amy then leads the other group um, of her, Riddell and Nefertiti. Um, so it's quite fun seeing these two groups um, um, working uh, to investigate what's going on. Meeting these different types of dinosaurs who, are, who look a lot better than uh, most of the previous dinosaur designs. Yeah, some of them are obviously CGI'd. But there's also quite a good use of practical models as well, like with when they write, uh, ride the um, doomed Tricy, the Triceratops. That was a great scene. Um, and yeah, and going back to the, uh, how they look, they are probably the most convincing dinosaurs. Yeah, I wonder if the Season 11 collectors, um, um, the collection Blu-ray box set will feature updated special effects for Invasion of the Dinosaurs. Because out of, if any story in, need, in that season needs updated special effects, if they're going to do the one for that series, it's got to be that story. Especially as the Time War has already got it for its, for its DVD. So it's got to be for Invasion of the Dinosaurs. Um, but And Dinosaurs on a Spaceship, this is a great story. It's not perfect, but, you know, it's fun, enjoyable and entertaining. And I think it's Chris Chibnall's best script before he became Shadow Showrunner. If Hungry Earth was its own separate episode, I would have said that. But it was with Cold War, so I can't, I would not. Um, that's that story would not be. So because that's the case, this is my favourite of Chris Chibnall's pre-showrunner scripts, and my least favourite, discluding Pond Life, I'd probably say the Path to Power Three. P.S. I think I would put is one of my favourites, possibly. If we were just going by a script, 
Possibly. Okay, so moving on to the top four. These are all from Series 7 Part 2, believe it or not. And these are all great episodes, believe it or not. We round off, um, we start off with number four, The Bells of St. John. Yeah, like how the top, uh, the bottom five of this ranking had both the start and end of Series 7 Part 1 um, in that bottom five, and then the other episodes had to come in later on. Um, the start and end of Series 7 Part 2, on the other hand, are in this top five with only two other episodes. Um, half of the, um, just under half of the rest of them be also being in this top half and the rest having come before. Um, Bells of St. John is definitely a um, copycat of The Idiot's Lantern, but I think it's a slightly better one. It's a, a more fast-paced and enjoyable one. Um, this is one of the stronger episodes for Clara Oswald as a character pre-Series 8, um, along with the next episode. Um, but unfortunately, she goes a bit downhill afterwards, and even then, she's not that... Um, she's not amazing in these first two, but um, she's still better than what she becomes later on pre-Series 8. That being said, Jenna Coleman's um, performance in this, this episode proves she was the right casting choice for the character. Um, say what you like about the character, but Jenna Coleman is brilliant. Um, Matt Smith continues to be brilliant. Celia Imbury is a great villain, even though we don't know too much about her, or at least until the end, where we get a pretty chilly and quite ballsy um, explanation of what, what happened to her, more or less, um, without having to directly say it. Um, it's quite chilling. Uh, chilling. Nice one, Stephen Moffat. The idea of using Wi-Fi and the modern technology, um, social media and, on and the internet and stuff is a nice odd concept and it doesn't feel dated as of 2020. Maybe in the future it will feel a bit dated to the modern day, but it doesn't feel dated at the moment. So, yeah, it was a really good idea for, um, and a really good way to go down. Um, and there is a few things left unexplained. You know, you know, again, the story is more focused on the Dr. Clara relationship. However, this time I think the story is a bit more focused on tying that in with the main threat as opposed to the snowman was and it feels a much more entertaining much more refresh refreshing this is stephen moffat's best script since a good man goes to war which is a, a, a shiny sign he's getting better this and the next episode on my list show he is he's getting better again speaking of which number three um, this is the series finale, and much better than series six is finale, as well as the finale to series seven part one. So, that, um, so um, wrapping up not just series seven part two, but the entire series seven as a whole, the name of the Doctor. This is honestly a pretty great finale. Yeah, there are a few issues that I've covered in the review, which I at time recording a uh, recording not too long ago. But, you know, I like this episode. I think it's pretty good. I don't like the fact that they kill off Jenny just to bring her back and then to erase her from time again. Um, yeah, that's just pointless. And then bring her back once uh, Clara's jumped into the time stream. Yeah, stop it, Stephen. You don't need to kill Jenny. Uh, and Strax is probably at his weakest in this story. And, um, yeah, um, but... I, this is definitely a um, strong story for the Doctor. River Song is back and she's much more mature and much more likeable than she was in the Angel State Manhattan. We've got a bit more um, character stuff for Clara. Just, I mean, not, not to the extent that the first two episodes of Series 7 Part 2, but a bit more than what we got throughout the rest of the series. Uh, Jenna Coleman does great. Uh, Richard E. Grant is much better here than he was in The Snowmen. And The Great Intelligence actually feels like a pretty decent, um, dastardly threat again. Um, not as much as say in the 60s, but he still feels like a bit more of a threat this time round, and does feel like a bit of a big bag. It, bad. It might have been good if he popped up in one more story to kind of um, feel, have him more of a series finale style bad, uh, big bad, but still, he, he still feels like a good, a pretty good threat for the story, and pretty dastardly. Um, so yeah, I think this works really well. Oh, and that ending. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. But before, but ex excluding that ending, that's this is still a really great story. There's a few issues in here, but ultimately, I think it's pretty good. Uh, moving on to the top two and the two 10 out of 10s. Believe it or not. And this, my number two choice is probably going to be a very controversial one. Because this one, for some reason, that I don't think very many people have actually explained, 
is very unpopular. I have seen Samuel Davis's um, Series 7 uh, video about Doctor Who's lowest point, and he wasn't very fond of Series 7 Part 2, nor... Uh, and I've also seen his one hand one his new series episodes rankings in just in under a minute per episode, but um, I not quite I can't quite remember what his problems with this episode were. As for anybody else, I don't know. So yeah, I, I don't know what the issues with this episode are. Apart from that, some people were weren't so keen on the emotional stuff. But yeah, I don't, I'm, but besides maybe Samuel Davis, and even then I can't quite remember at, at this point of rec at time recording, um, I don't really know why people dislike this one. Number two is, of course, The Rings of Akaten. This one is absolutely fantastic, in my opinion. I don't know why people don't like this one. Um, so, uh, for me, I just love it. Mary Galau is a great supporting character, and Amelia Jones does a great job in the uh, in the role, and also a great singing voice. I love the stuff with Clara's parents at the start of the episode. The visuals are stunning, and it's great that we see different monster designs throughout. It's pretty cool. Um, also, I forgot to mention in my Nightmare and Silver review, there's that one of these creatures. It's um, one of these creatures actually pops up in Hedwig's. Ah, that's what that world was called, Hedwig's World of Wonder, or whatever. The, um, uh, Jace, um, Jason Watkins' character's collection that he has there. Uh, one of these creatures turns up there. That's nice. They're reusing some props, just like how they've reused some older monsters for, um, props for this and costumes for this story. Um, and I think it's handled really well. It's really nice and some great stuff. Um, and of course, the emotion, I think, is handled really well with the whole stuff with Clara's relationship, as well as the stuff with Mary and um, the Act 10 people and the 11th Doctor's best speech ever um, at the end when he confronts the Lone God, as well as when Clara comes to help him out just afterwards. Some beautiful, beautiful scenes. And the long song is just a wonderful, wonderful song. It's probably, it's just amazing. Notably, this is the 100th episode of the show of the revived series to be filmed. And I think they did a spectacular job. But it wasn't the 100th episode to be aired. That episode is my number one. Number one. And you'll probably be a, a bit surprised to see this episode here. Unless you've been watching the reviews. My best episode of Series 7 Part 2. And in fact, the best episode of the series as a whole. The Crimson Horror. Mark Gatiss does it again. He writes another brilliant episode. In fact, this is probably my favourite Mark Gatiss episode. Um, yeah, I think this is my favourite Mark Gatiss written episode. Um, it's also my favourite with the Paternoster gang. Surprisingly, this, they're at their best in this episode, especially Jenny when she gets a bit to do in the, quite a bit to do in the first half. Um, first half, uh, no, first third. Um, I will admit Clara is a bit bland here, but Jenna Coleman still does a good job, and she's. Uh, the character's still a bit better than some other stories, like Jenny to the Centre of the TARDIS. Uh, it might be one of her more weaker days off uh, days, but, you know, she's still all right. She's still okay. She doesn't really harm the story. Mrs. Gilliflower is a brilliant villain, and the great late, sadly, Diana, Dame Diana Rigg, was outstanding. She was so perfect for the role. This episode was more or less tailored for her as an actress to play that villain, as well as her daughter, Rachel Sterling, to play the character's daughter, who is another great is another great character and a great ally for the Doctor and his friends, um, and I think this is just, it's just a great episode. It's a great mystery story with um, <laughs> teaching this um, poison from the dawn of time, and I think it's it uses the past Doctor gang really well, and the um, uh, Doctor is pretty is also really great. Um, I love the villain. Love the setting, love the timing, and I think it just works really well. There are a few niggles like Clara, and I think um, not doing that much. She's all right. She doesn't get in the way. She's not annoying. She's just not really that necessary for the story. It could have worked as a doc as a companion night story, to be honest. Um, but you know, it's, she doesn't get in the way, so I'll I'll forgive it. Um, love that guy. Um, the um, the Mork guy. Him going the creams and horror. I think having that character say. The Crimson Horror three times or so would probably have gotten annoying for uh, for people. However, they cast someone with such a great voice that it sounded so cool when he said it. So I didn't mind. In fact, I loved it. Um, 
I don't mind the Thomas Thomas joke. I just wish the character, that guy, uh, that boy spent, uh, did a bit more in the story. Um, and the whole plan kind of makes a bit of sense. And also that um, piano thing, and when, when it twists, twists around to the control of the rockets, I forgot to say this in the review, but it looks a bit like it was taken from part of Catherine Sardik's um, machine um, set from A Christmas Carol. That's, again, if that was yeah, is the case, then... That's a good use of recycling props as well as the costumes, as we saw uh, in Rings of Akaten and Nightmare and Silver. So, yeah, and I thought this was a really greatly directed episode. Saul Metstein proves himself to be the best director of this series, directing Dinosaurs on a Spaceship, A Town Called Mercy, um, The Snowmen, The Crimson Horror, and The Name of the Doctor. Although in the production order, um, Snowmen comes after this one. And I think, the, say what you like about the stories, I think Saul Metstein does a fantastic job in directing them, two of which are in this, um, three of which actually are in this top five and another one in the top six. Um, there's only really one that's below the, the top half, um, but that's more on a story basis than a visuals. Um, even though I did say Dr. Wither in the Wardrobe looked a bit more visually stunning, but you know, it, uh, you know, he can't have everything. Uh, but Storm Metzstein definitely proves himself to be the best director of the series by direct, by doing five greatly directed stories, four of which are, are four of the best stories of the series. Especially this one. This one is just absolutely amazing. And yeah, this is how you direct an episode, unlike uh, the directors of episodes 10 and 12, Jenny at the Centre of the TARDIS, and the uh, Nightmare and Silver. Jenny's direction felt a bit off, and Nightmares just felt like it was in too much of a hurry. But this episode, like Name of the Doctor, just feels like it's 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 taking its time to tell, tell the story, but it's not dull, it's not boring. And then when we get to the end, it's not a bad reveal. It's some pretty good endings. In fact, this is one of the stronger endings. Bar the final scene with Angie and Artie, but that wasn't really uh, Mark Gatiss' fault. That was probably due to set them up for the next story. Um, and whatever the next story would have done with them, it would this scene wouldn't have harmed this story, where, because our perception of the characters, and in fact the scene more comes from what happens in Nightmare and Silver, and what doesn't happen after Nightmare and Silver, rather than what actually happens in this story. So I'm not going to blame Mark Gatiss for that scene. And you know, if Angie and Artie were great characters in the next story and the following story, and if they did stuff, it would have been a, it probably would have been fine, no problem. So, yeah, again, don't they mark Gatiss, unless it was his idea. Um, but final scene aside, this is a really great story and really enjoyable and such a such a great adventure. Um, these top two stories are exactly what Doctor Who should be about about, and. Yeah, and it's great to see that writers like Neil Cross and Mark Gatiss understand that. And not only that, but they relish in it. So to recap this um, pretty lengthy ranking, um, to recap, number 15, Asylum of the Daleks. Number 14, Journeys to the Centre of the TARDIS. Number 13, The Snowmen. Number 12, The Doctor's Widow in the Wardrobe. Number 11, The Angels Take Manhattan. Number 10, Cold War. Number 9, Nightmare and Silver. Number 8, The Power of Three. Number 7, Hyde. Number 6, A Town Called Mercy. Number 5, Dinosaurs on a Spaceship. Number 4, The Bells of St. John. Number 3, The Name of the Doctor. Number 2, The Rings of Akaten. And number 1, The Crimson Horror. I can't do it as good as that guy from the episode. So that's it from Doctor Who Series 7, aka Season 33. That's it. 33 seasons down, five to go. Woo! Um, but before we get on to the next series, we've got another specials mini series to experience first. The 2013 specials mini series, um, which feature the day of the Doctor and the time of the Doctor. They're next, and then after that, we will be moving on to series eight, the first series with the 12th Doctor. Um, so yeah, series seven's been a bit of a rocky ride, hasn't it? But you know, I like it mostly. Most of it. I like most of it. Yeah, there are some terrible ones in there, but there's also some really good stuff there too. So it proves once again that every series has its ups and downs. Every series, literally. Um, even the ones I'm not so keen on, like season 17, there's some ups and downs there. The ups are some of the best ups I've seen, whilst the downs aren't some of the worst ones, but there's more of them than ups. So yeah, and season 24 was very mixed for me. 50-50 um, exactly, to be precise. And then the other 36 seasons... More more good in them, I think. Uh, well, then again, we'll see about series eight and nine. Um, but certainly, uh, there's more. Some of them have quite a lot uh, weaker stuff, and then you've got some with more good stuff and some with more weaker stuff. Um, 
well, not more weak stuff than good stuff, unlike season 17, but um, the weaker stuff is weaker than some of the other seasons. And yeah, I think season, season 33, series 7, is probably going to be lower down on the overall ranking. Um, certainly will on a new series one, because there is, it's not more bad than good, or, weak, or mediocre to bad than mediocre to good, but it, there is a bit more of a kind of that mediocre area as well. We kind of, it's all over the place with this series. It's kind of all over the place. So this is probably the most rocky and turbulent series of the revised series so far and of the show since season 24, as I addressed in the name of the Doctor review. Whether series 8 will be any uh, better or not is uh, we'll find out next time after the 2013 mini, uh, specials miniseries. Um, until then, thank you for watching and I shall see you guys next time for the start of the 2013 mini um, specials miniseries which will be with the, um, starting with the 50th anniversary special, The Day of the Doctor. And I cannot fucking wait for that episode. I'm so excited for that one. The 50th anniversary celebration party has begun, people. Let's have a good time. I'll see you guys then. Goodbye. <laughs>